Right, good morning, gentlemen, and welcome. And one of those is my study at Essex University, a fantastic university, where I was taught environmental politics as part of my course. And there, um, Dr. Hugh Ward told me all about nuclear and dispelled the myths of nuclear power and told me about the many ins and outs of what goes on. So that was my first sort of connection with nuclear in, in this locality. I would like to tell you about what it has been like so far to live alongside the construction of Hinkley Sea. And then I will hand over to Katie. In 2011, EDF was granted permission to begin preliminary works on the Hinkley Sea site. Then they were granted permission to build the jetty that was supposed to be operating by 2013 to bring in aggregates. It was not until 2016 that Theresa May finally signed the financial and legal agreement with the French and Chinese to build Hinkley Sea. But in the light of climate change, the design of HPC was not safe. We hope this challenge will also be of benefit to Sizewell and Bradwell in their endeavours. These photos have been taken since the start of the construction of HPC. The black line represents the start of using actual data from satellites, and that's where they all start to agree. Even with a two degree rise in sea level, one in five people globally will see their coastal cities submerged. Cities like London, New York, and Shanghai. For protected species such as Atlantic salmon, European eels, Thwaite shad, sea and river lamprey, and sea trout, all of these are protected by international legislation. This is Sizewell Beach part of Suffolk's heritage coast and area of outstanding natural beauty. It's a magnet for bird watchers. But it's under severe threat. EDF Energy is planning to build a nuclear power station here. The government wants to build, they originally wanted to build 10 reactors. Um, it's very much like the 80s. Uh, they've been knocked back, as we know, to three now that are still in the running. Um, will we just get Hinkley? No, we're not going to let Hinkley go ahead. I don't think we're going to get any. But to me, the uh, primary concern is to make sure that we are not divided insofar as this is our case here in size, or this is your case there in Hinkley and Bradwell, that we work together <coughs> to make sure that not one of these sites goes ahead. The thing that concerns me about uh, the way the situation has developed so far is that EDF have been, well, what can I say, um, less than candid with the information they're putting out into the public domain. They've had three rounds of consultation, and each round of consultation was worse than the previous one in terms of the information that they've given to people upon which to base their objections. And the reasons it was chosen are very pragmatic. It was chosen because um, there was some infrastructure there, uh, the land was available, it was in friendly ownership, and also, it was reckoned that people would be friendly. They'd had a power station there, they loved it, you know, no more of it. And the Bramwell B people at the moment are asking for people to send in their fond memories of the power station. <laughs> so, they're also calling the area around it the Bradwell community. You know, we're all in this happy little bunch of people that are looking forward to this power station. Uh, we have actually sent in a, a number of uh, things about our memories of Bradwell. Uh, we hope that they will be published on the website. We have some doubts. <laughs> um, but it is an unsuitable site. So what we build now is going to remain dangerous and lurking on those sites, regardless of all this policy stuff about disposal. The, the fact is, to all intents and purposes, 
the policy for managing radioactive waste is storage on site because nothing else is going to happen for the next two, three generations. So we have to plan with that in mind. That is, that is actually the answer. Um, and uh, it's on sites like this. When the, these projects for, were first talked about 10 years ago, then if you wanted nuclear power, and I don't, but EDF would be seen as probably the ideal partner. They had huge financial resources, they had huge technical resources, so if you wanted to build one, they were the people that had the resources that you need. They had been part privatised four years previously, so they were still 85% state-owned, they were one of the big uni uh, utilities in Europe, and they had expanded outside France into the electricity industries of UK, Italy, Germany. So what about the position in the UK? Well, they made losses in, in Britain last year, uh, 382 million compared to 213 million, so it's not doing well. They're losing market share down to, from 13 to 11% to all these new companies like Ovo and Bulb and all these other companies. Their market share is now up to 27%, which is more than double the next largest company. But if you look at that, Hinkley B and Hunterston B are going to go very soon, uh, probably not soon enough. Uh, Hesham 1 and Hartlepool, they're only talking about 2024. Dungeness was approved at 2028, but the day it was approved it went out of service and is still out of service more than a year later. So when that will come back is anybody's guess. It has a couple of coal-fired plants, they'll go very soon. So that will leave it with one modern gas-fired power station. If it builds uh, Hinkley and size, well, of course, it will get its market share back, but it will have lost its market power because in the current position, it sells to its competitors and it sets the price. When it builds Hinkley and size, well, all the, market, all the power is sold to the government at a fixed price. So it, it will have no power over the market. It will have no power that can allow it to give an advantage to its retail business. It's not new to us this. We've been doing this since the early 90s really. Um, we are, have been promoting best practice and, and promoting that widely really as well. But we've become flavour of the month now. If climate emergency now is, is across the board. Over 200 20 councils have passed climate emergency resolutions now in the country. So we've done three reports in the past five months looking at what that means really. We inevitably say, yes, we, there is ways to make money and, and to find money for this, but we've got to get more social support for more powers and more resources to do that really. Without that, the climate emergency simply cannot be tackled to the way that we need to do, to do with all of those issues you've just heard about, climate change, and sea level rise, and, temperature rise and so on really. A great example of one of our members from the Leeds Council in the UK for this is Dundee. Uh, they've got, already got 130 electric minicabs, the largest local authority fleet with 117 electric cars and vans, council owned four solar powered charging hubs and the highest number of rapid charges of any UK city. Again a council moving forward very imaginatively we are pushing that forward to all our members as, as a, a case of best practice. There's also vehicle to grid. Central local government alone has a fleet of 75,000 vehicles. Electric vehicles could come back to depots. Uh, they often would then still have a night turn charge. You could sell that back to the grid during the peak zone and charge again in the small hours. That's the opportunity uh, councils have. It could save money and then generate money at the same time. Of course, promoting walking and cycling, it's all not about cars, this, really. You've got to look at different ways to get people to do low-carbon low work as well. Parliament has said this, that widespread personal vehicle ownership is not compatible with decarbonisation because of all the issues it creates. So there's a great example of Edinburgh closing the, the roads. So popular, it's now pushing forward with widening pedestrianisation in the city centre. But all it should be about is pushing that any new building should be zero carbon. It's ridiculous that any new building that is coming up onto the stream isn't zero carbon, yet many still are really as well. You could easily use your power to go beyond building standards 
and you can start looking at developing things like this school in Wolverhampton, passive house, complete zero carbon. It can be done, and there are many examples in local authority estates as well. well we just got just short of half an hour uh, for any any questions or comments. Big financial resources to help us. We need help with that. We work with European-based organisations, the Citizen Degree for Europe, Alliance of Regions, uh, other big landers around Germany, Austria and so on. NEP should work with that with those networks and they can easily put you through those contacts after the meeting as well. Uh, EN6, as it stands at the moment, is there to um, make sure that the developments under construction are deployed by 2025. And as Andy said earlier, that, there are, that it rules everything out. There's a review of the N6 going ahead um, to extend that 2025 to 2035. But um, the fact is that we're currently operating in a, in a, well, a legal vacuum. And the second thing is that in terms of emergency planning around the plants, there's been a review of a thing called REPIA, which is the legislation which covers uh, the siting of the, the, the extent of the detailed emergency planning zone around nuclear power stations. Um, we're not complying with it, but the implementation of the uh, basic safety standards is something that we would like to know why the UK is not moving faster on it. And we might well be using taxpayer and, um, uh, you know, there could be some subsidy going from this country to the Chinese, uh, who we want to embrace in trading relationships. On the other hand, they haven't got permission. Um, and there may be some hiccups along the way there, I don't know, but it may scrape through. Uh, and there are so many hurdles to be passed. And the security one is the unique feature of this, if you like. I do think local councils and councillors should be pressing on this point, if, if they are concerned about it. But it is a matter, I think, at the, at the higher levels where uh, of national security and so on.